uh, hosted by the Ecological Design Center and the School of Architecture and Allied Arts here at the University of Oregon. Um, with us this afternoon, uh, I'd like to say this for the first time, direct from Hong Kong <laughs> is Juan Du. Juan Du is the founding director of IDU Architecture, a research and design office with projects ranging from the built uh, extent, extent of built forms to social and ecological processes of the city. She has been invited to speak, has been published, and has exhibited internationally. She, is the, she was the chief curator of Hong Kong's exhibition at the 2010 Venice Biennale of Architecture, uh, the housing of an affordable city exhibition at the 2011 Shenzhen Hong Kong Bai City Biennale, and was assistant curator for the first Shenzhen Biennale of Urbanism and Architecture in 2005. Joan Du is also an associate professor and director of the Masters of Architecture program at the University of Hong Kong. She was previously taught at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Graduate Center at Peking University. She holds a master's degree in architecture from Princeton University and is a recipient of the U.S. Fulbright Foundation Scholarship for Research on the Transformation of the Contemporary Chinese City. Her talk today is entitled Urban Ecologies. Please help us welcome Juan Du. Is this audible? Yes. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to all of you for the invitation to come and speak. Um, I, I did come directly from Hong Kong, a stopover in San Francisco, uh, but I, I also went to a big state school in the U.S. Uh, for undergraduate studies. It's a big football team and a beautiful picturesque campus just like yours, so it's quite nostalgic for me to walk around yesterday last night and, and today. So it's, um, it's really nice to, to be here. And it's reminded me how beautiful spring can be uh, when uh, you're in an environment that has very distinct seasons. Uh, this is very different from Hong Kong, where the weather is about uh, 10 months of the year. It's just hot, humid summer. Uh, and then the other two months is kind of really cold, kind of uh, uh, non-weather for a while, so it's, it's really nice to be here. Um, I, I bring with me um, sort of a three-part talk, and, and we'll see how time goes if I, I'll make it all three parts. Uh, the first part is uh, research, um, kind of a research project that's been ongoing for the past uh, nearly, probably nearly a decade on uh, a phenomenon of uh, informal urbanization in Shenzhen, the city adjacent to Hong Kong. Um, and the second part is a urban design project that is located in Shenzhen that very much is based on the research, the ongoing research of uh, urbanization in a, a developing, developing city and more importantly, um, a rapidly developing uh, environment. And then finally, the last is, I think, a really fun project I'd like to share with you, um, something that I did with my students uh, this recent past semester. So we'll see if we, we make it there. But all of them um, have a, a broad, I think, philosophy that is something that I've been trying to, uh, in the office, to cultivate through design research projects and also through teachings, those notion urban ecologies, and essentially, I, I'm an architect, I'm not a landscape architect, and I'm not um, an ecologist, but uh, I believe that we all should um, really understand the built environment as something that must be rooted in the environmental systems, biological systems, the social and community resources, the economic operations of the city, and the cultural values of the, of, of the context. And it's only through engaging actively with these various parameters that, um, that the built uh, via our design interventions comes to life and can really truly have a responsible and sustainable meaning. So, th so that's the, the, the broad um, context or philosophical uh, approach uh, of, the, of the works. So the, the first part, uh, like I said, it, it's a research project on Shenzhen. It's titled 1,000 Years of an Instant City. Um, I, uh, as, as we're literally thousands of miles away, uh, I just would like to know a little bit the, the context I'm speaking. How many of you have been to Shenzhen? 
Okay, so a few. Um, okay, that's good. How many have been to Hong Kong? More, more people. Than okay, good. Thank you. So um, we're talking about 10, 20 percent of the audience. So um, Shenzhen is located in the Pearl River Delta. Uh, I'm not. Sh I, I'm sure all of you, even though if you have not uh, been to Shenzhen, um, if you're familiar with uh, global economy or at least Ram Kohaus's research through Harvard, um, you probably have, if not read, have seen the big fat book called uh, Great Leap Forward, which is really about the urbanization and Pearl River Delta. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, the Pearl River Delta is, um, do we have a pointer? Um, is um, located in southern China, uh, bordering uh, Hong Kong and Macau. Its current population, it, the conservative estimate is about 45 million with a um, GDP of 300 billion US dollars. So it, it's, it's absolutely a, a key player um, in the global economy. And uh, what's remarkable is that it's quite recent. Uh, it's only been 30 years, really, since um, it, it started to take on that stage. Um, this is a national image of kind of the mouse of uh, the Pearl River Delta uh, in 1979. It's, the, it's a significant year uh, for my part of the research, which I will get to. Um, so this is the infrared image. So what you see that's red will be vegetation uh, and the little specks of white. Um, not sure what the point is, uh, but along to the right-hand side, uh, along the uh, river is uh, urbanized urbanized land. This is 2003. Um, so 20 years, essentially. Uh, the rate of urbanization and sort of the material construction in the region is phenomenal. In fact, it's the, according to NASA's research, it's the uh, only, it's sort of unprecedented in human history that such a massive scale of urbanization has permanently altered the weather pattern of the region and therefore uh, influencing uh, globally. So just to give a bit of context, a, a lot of the urbanization of the area was really led by uh, China's government, uh, Chinese government's policy of open up and reform in the late 70s and early 90s, with, was especially with the setup of special economic zone in southern China, especially in Guangzhou province. Um, there are three special economic zones in Guangzhou province, Zhuhai, Shenzhen, and Shantou. And in this case, I'm really looking at Shenzhen, which was established in 1979, um, which many people will call that that is the birth of the city. That is the birth of Shenzhen. Thank you. This one, okay. uh, that is the birth of Shenzhen, the city, uh, which is something that I actually contest in, in uh, my later research. Again, uh, just quickly through a few of the images. Um, again, the year 1979. Um, and you can see. There we go. You can see that there are some um, specks of white uh, urbanized land, especially along the coast of Shenzhen. So th this is the administrative border between Shenzhen and the rest of Guangzhou, uh, Guangzhou province. And there is a border here between Shenzhen and Hong Kong. So this would be the new territories of Hong Kong. 1986, five years later, you can see that the urban cluster really started there and is starting to grow. Five years later, 1990, 94, 98, 2002, 2004. So this is 10 years ago. And the urbanization has, um, it essentially has stopped only because there's no more land to grow. Um, all of the, from starting from 2004, all of the green areas you see are really very, very tall mountain ranges that cannot be flattened. Uh, a lot of the urbanized land actually were very hilly terrain and agricultural land that was flattened to make way for the city. So uh, just as in terms of a population and economic uh, contrast, you, uh, in 1979, the population is 300,000 with a GT GDP of 1.96 uh, RMB. This is uh, mean RMB. And by year 2005, the population already reached 12 million with a GDP of 500 billion RMB. So the rate of growth 
is quite unprecedented uh, in terms of both economic development and population, uh, population increase. Um, because of the, uh, what I was talking about earlier in terms of the uh, geological, uh, now that's kind of the geological Im imposition of uh, simply no mo there are no more land to develop. Uh, since 2005, the city have turned its attention to some what they've called underdeveloped and undervalued land. Uh, and these are uh, the, the topic of, of my, uh, the focus of my research, um, which I would give you a hint of here. Um, so uh, much of the uh, much of the city are extremely, uh, I would say, high rise. Not necessarily for me, it's not necessarily high density, but they are de develop uh, demolishing um, in the process of demolishing a lot of particular um, urban clusters or enclaves that they see is not compatible with the image of the city that it's trying to cultivate. And uh, as far as the image of the city goes, this is a very uh, representational image of the planning of the city. Uh, you have basically an absolute central axis um, with with the city hall here. This is the, the, the government seat. This is a grand, uh, grand urban park. It's actually a, a very beautiful park with um, a large central park, is what they call it, with, uh, with a crystal island in the middle. Um, OMA, Ram, uh, Rams office in Hong Kong, just won the competition last year to design that transportation hub. Um, and an exhibition center, a very large scale exhibition center designed by German German office. So, uh, and either side is designed, it's planned and designed to be a high rise um, and ha high value office towers and uh, residential blocks. So that's a, a bit zoom in image of kind of this axle formal um, planning. Uh, all of these roads are um, eight lane roads basically on either way and to cross from the what they call the sort of citizen center into the park is absolutely risking your life. Um, I, I would not recommend it. I tried to do it once to take photographs and it was very, very scary. Um, and this is, again, this is the Crystal Island I mentioned earlier off of the central axis. I want to draw your attention to this. This, by the way, this is a map uh, that was published in the year 2000. Um, and the, what you see in this area, I want you to keep in mind, it looks like quite a Corbusian um, kind of uh, urban courtyard of um, high, essentially high-rise residential buildings is what is planned. So this is published, um, the map image is published in 2000, the year 2000. This is a satellite image from 2008 of the exact same area. So you can see um, the Central Park is actually quite blank. There's no vegetation and the Crystal Island is not there. Uh, and this is the actual state of uh, that particular urban block. So essentially this is the image of the city, of really what the, the, the city would like to portray as a global city, a, a economic powerhouse, um, and this is the actual reality of the city. Um, and I like to just take you along a quick tour. If you've been to Shenzhen, chances are you've driven across this artery, it's called Shenan Boulevard. Uh, it, it is sort of the central artery that many uh, important Political, in this case, this is the polit political seat, the uh, political, cultural, economic, and industrial zones. They are all kind of um, centered uh, along this, this cluster. So uh, your taxi or your bus probably just went through this uh, very beautifully landscaped and manicured uh, urban landscape. Um, so zooming in, this is Shenan Boulevard. Um, I want to draw your attention to something quite peculiar. You see these little blocks here, uh, these small gridded um, urbanization. Even here, it's, it's this little tiny cluster stuck between two golf courses. 
Um, and it's not unusual. Uh, see, this is that cluster. This is the one I had showed you earlier. Um, if we sort of kind of move along the urban block, you see they're really uh, literally r quite along the road, except when you're driving on the central artery, because these are kind of uh, hidden behind vegetation and really beautiful palm trees and very beautiful um, uh, high-rise uh, shopping malls or, or buildings, uh, chances are you really would never see it. And if we zoom in a little bit more, so you can see kind of the contrast and scale between the buildings that line the road and these smaller blocks. So if we zoom in, this is where they are. Um, this is a, a particular urban village called Bai Shizhou. Um, it is right in the middle of the most uh, well landscaped um, district in Shenzhen called uh, Overseas Chinese Town, uh, OCT. Um, it has the highest real estate value in terms of residential development. And this, this uh, enclave is right in the middle of all of, this, uh, all of these uh, essentially tourist attraction and um, very expensive luxury villas. Um, so these enclave are made up of uh, these type of buildings the, the tile houses in front of you and in the foreground is actually pretty rare. Um, there are not so many of them left. These were the buildings that were built uh, in, the er, uh, well, in the early 1980s, right after the establishments of the central, uh, of the special economic zone. Um, all, most of these type of buildings have given away to these, um, these I guess in, in Eugene, they would be considered mid to high rise. Uh, in Shenzhen, Hong Kong, this is considered low rise uh, <laughs> of these buildings. Um, and what's interesting is that each of these buildings is actually owned by one person. And that person essentially is the original villagers of uh, over 300 villages that used to occupy the land in Shenzhen. So when uh, the central government decided to make Shenzhen into a special economic zone and later municipal city, um, the common perception is that there was nothing there. Uh, if you read any uh, either scholarly or journalistic writing on Shenzhen, usually the first sentence is, um, oh, in 1979, uh, there was nothing, uh, this, or this sleepy little fishing village turned into the mega city overnight. That's kind of the typical uh, jargon. Um, but the, but act in actual uh, terms, the, the land was fully occupied and fully used before it became a city. Um, as I said, there were over 300 villages, and each village had a few hundred uh, villagers, and they, they farmed the land. They, they, grew, uh, they grew rice, they grew bananas, lychee. Uh, they were also, uh, especially along the coast, they were fishermen, they grew shrimp and oysters. So the land was completely productive already at the, at the time. And when the government turned the land into the city, they basically um, bought off all of the farming land and gave the village land back to the, or gave the village land um, to the original villagers to say, okay, you can build a single family home uh, in this particular area, and we're gonna buy off all of the farming land from you to build our city. Um, and uh, Essentially, the villagers didn't have a choice to say no. Um, so this is what they built. Um, what is uh, what, what I mentioned that what you're seeing essentially is the first generation of the buildings they have built with the tiled roof. And what you see now is probably sixth and seventh generation of the buildings in these villages. And the common term is they're referred to as urban villages or villages in the city. And it's a, t a way kind of to designate its less, less I think, social, uh, less legal status, more social status. These are really seen as not part of the city formal. They're really seen as an anomaly or as what the government would call the cancers in the urban fabric. But if we kind of zoom in a little, you, you'll see that it, it is quite incongruent. It, it is quite in contrast to kind of Shenzhen, the global city image where you have uh, essentially uh, waste just kind of collected on, on this, the corner of this public space because the civic infrastructure of the city actually doesn't extend into these urban enclaves. Um, so in terms of sanitation, 
power, electricity, sewage, they all are self-generated in these urban clusters. But what drew my interest when I first uh, started getting to know these places is really the vibrant um, humanity that, that is in these, uh, in these neighborhoods. Um, in this case, you know, and also the incredible uh, flexibility and diversity of space use. And this is a, like a, a, a basketball court that's very actively used. And in the daytime, it's also used as temporary parking for merchants that come in and drop off food. Um, it, it's, it's very much used uh, on a daily basis. And at night, this area becomes a da uh, paidang, essentially a, a food court. And, and if you essentially walk into this place like I did for the first time, this was almost 10 years ago at 2 in the morning because I couldn't sleep because I was put by the government in this luxury uh, hotel next door. Couldn't sleep, started walking, I stumbled this place 2 in the morning and I was totally shocked. There was dogs and kids and babies and food and smoke everywhere. And it's so different from the city that I, I came to know as Shenzhen through my uh, kind of working relationship with the government at the time. Um, this is right next to the basketball court. This is a well that has been here, I've been told by the local villagers, for over 8,000 years. So they still get the water from the well it, it, because they said actually the water here is much cleaner than what they get out of the tap in their homes. Um, like I said, the, the scale of the space, and, and again, this is really unintentional. The scale of the urban streets are... Um, are very pedestrian friendly and beautiful. And, and I'm looking at this, I'm thinking you, you feel like this may be familiar, but uh, in Shenzhen, this is, uh, unless you're in one of the urban villages, uh, you, you would never actually see urban spaces like this right on the sidewalk or right on the street. And there are a lot of very interesting, um, I would say architectural uh, anomalies uh, in the urban villages. For example, this is a, um, a elementary school for uh, for um, the children of the migrant workers who live in the urban villages. Um, because, the, because most of the migrant workers who live in these places uh, do not hold the official status of the hukou, which is the Chinese term for kind of urban citizenship, um, they do not, they have no access to the social uh, welfares that is available to um, to regular urban citizens. So that, that ranges from medical all the way to education of the young. So um, this one particular urban village kind of took out its initiative and they converted what was an abandoned parking garage into an elementary school. Uh, and I, I have never seen such a beautiful way and playful way of entering an elementary school. Um, it's quite fun, and then they converted these sort of spaces inside into the into classrooms. Uh, I just wonder that <laughs> it must be fun to kind of grow up uh, and learn um, how not to walk in a straight line uh, in here. Um, and other things that, that is very touching and then I think reminds me of lessons we have forgotten about public space and community. Um, this is just a tiny little, you can see it's maybe a meter and a half wide street uh, alleyway in one of the urban villages uh, with a, a small temple at the end. Um, every month during a particular Chinese uh, lunar calendar month, um, this alleyway is filled with people, um, of people who not only live in this urban village but from all over the city. Um, that's because this temple has been here for three, <coughs> four hundred years old. Um, and it's, it's known to be able to grant your wishes. It's, it's kind of like the St. Petersburg, but in a shoebox. Um, so they, uh, they line up the street, they, they each take turns to give incense and they leave. And this is only one day of the month. And the rest of the, the 29 days, you know, it's just a quiet little room with children playing in front of it. Um, it you know, it, it makes us question this notion that somehow that we need um, these grand, large-scale public spaces um, in, in a high-density or, or high-volume city. Um, this is a, a very typical site in the urban villages. Uh, practically all of the urban villages will have one of these. These are ancestry halls 
that um, you know they they've been around for as long as the village uh, has been there. Um, while the building itself, this may have been rebuilt last year, right? While the the material itself is not necessarily historic, but its function is. It really acts as a, a community center that that attracts um, the, the the locals. Uh, for example, you know, eating. Outside, um, this is sort of intern lo uh, looking out that you know that space then becomes a parking space for people. Um, this is kind of the first courtyard when you enter. Uh, this is a, a young man who was re really actively wanting to show off his skills of kickboxing the day I was visiting. So the, the basically, this space is a gym for the younger gen younger generation. And you go inside the, the sort of second ceremonial courtyard is uh, full of mahjong tables for the middle-aged parents. Uh, and then further inside still are the plaques um, to sort of the ancestors who has passed away uh, from, you know, from several hundred years old to recently. So what is interesting to me, and from the courtyard you can see these concrete sort of modern buildings that's been built to house um, the, the, the migrants who's seeking cheap and affordable housing in here. And what's remarkable to me is that this notion that there is really a continuity of history, that history here is not designated to be a p particular space or particular view or uh, in isolation from what is happening today, that it is, is, it's quite a seam seamless understanding of the past, present, and future, which is so different from the way that when uh, generally when people talk about Shenzhen, somehow there is this notion that there was a tabula rasa, there was a blank slate, everything was wiped clean, and then you put the city there. Um, and to me, that not only is this a, uh, a false understanding, it's a very dangerous one, um, because, uh, because then the notion of a special ec economic zone that needs to have a blank slate or that was based on a blank slate that became very successful economically, this notion has been exported all over the world. Um, there's, uh, in India, over several thousand special economic zones in Africa, in Latin America, and most of them are extremely contagious, and there's a lot of violence, actually, with local villagers when they are trying to do this. Um, and most of the government who want to create special economic zones in these developing countries have Shenzhen in mind as model uh, without realizing actually um, there's such a big element of the city. It's still from the, the aspect of the, the region or the land that wasn't wiped clean, that has stayed there and became a very vibrant um, aspect of the continuous city. Um, yeah, I have this image up. It's a, it's a very typical local scene. It, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a small convenience shop when you walk into the urban villages. And what you see, these brightly colored papers, what's on them are uh, rent, uh, the value of rent uh, for either a room, an apartment, for either a day or a month or a year. So what happens is that if you are a 17-year-old uh, from a rural village in Henan, you come to Shenzhen, you have no money, you're looking for a job, um, where do you stay? You sort of come into one of these urban villages, you look up um, the, 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 the phone number and the, the price of housing, and you get a room for a day and maybe for a month. Um, so what has happened is that all of the urban villages has become homes to the majority of the working class migrants who are not living in uh, dormitories, dormitory campuses, uh, like uh, such as Fox, Fox Kong, and uh, that's another story about why, uh, for me, these type of spaces are so valuable. Because I'm sure you guys are all aware of the dangers and tragedies of what happens in these dormitories, uh, where you have no freedom, as you have here. And the type of uh, urban space you see and neighborliness is quite amazing. Now keep in mind the people you see when you walk into these ur urban villages and walk around, they're not the, they're not the original villagers. The original villagers are landlords that own these buildings and build them. They're very, very wealthy. They're my neighbors in Hong Kong. They send their kids to Cambridge and Harvard because they collect rent from all the people who live there. 
So essentially the 90% of the population in these urban villages um, are the, the migrant workers who come, you know, some of them have been here for 20 years and some here for 20 days. Um, but there, there is two, I would say two different types of, three different types of citizenship in the city. There are the urban residents who live in the city proper, who, you know, are what you say white collar workers. There are the villagers, the vision of villagers who owns uh, these sort of plots of land, who's built these buildings, and they're collecting rent from the migrants, and then there are the migrants. So it's really a three-tier uh, three tier social structure we're talking about. So I get back to this image. This is uh, the first urban village that government tried to demolish um, in two da or demolished in 2005, and it was quite a, a media spectacle. The, 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 the mayor at the time invited all of the state media, all the local media to come and witness the demolition. Um, what is interesting is that several of the buildings, this is one of them, um, after the, the it's kind of the mayor pressed the ceremonial red button and the Big Bang, it didn't, it didn't fall uh, the first time and it didn't fall the second time. They had to do it three times to demolish it. And what's ironic is that the, the reason, one of the biggest, um, there's many, but one of the biggest uh, stated reasons for the demolition of these is poor quality of construction. Um, but what this process have told us is actually these buildings, because they are owned and built by landowners, and this is very rare in China, uh, you guys uh, would know that in China there is no private land ownership in cities, so there's very few actually uh, buildings that's owned by a private individual. But because these are, because it's this strange loophole, um, the owner, the original villager, hired the best construction team. They use the best material. They use tons of concrete, tons of steel, and really made sure that the building is of high quality. Um, uh, but uh, as you can, can as you can imagine, this is not necessarily all across the board. So, what you see is that these type of buildings are being demolished to make way for what's behind it. These, right? These are uh, high luxury high-rise residential towers. Is is the Hong Kong model of uh, housing towers with a podium that's of shopping malls in the bottom and uh, apartments above. Um, the reality is that the people that's been moved out of these village, uh, these village built housing cannot afford these buildings. So essentially what you have is that you have very large populations displaced each time there is a demol demolition of the current urban village. Um, so you might think that these urban villages are um, a minor part of the city, but this is a density mapping. Essentially, it uh, has a building footprint of all of the buildings within the urban center of Shenzhen. Um, so Shenan Boulevard is right there, kind of cutting through. Um, but if you look at this drawing, what's uh, interesting you might notice is that there are these kind of black zones of density that is kind of dispersed throughout the city. And what they are, they are all the urban villages. So now um, there are remaining no around 90 urban villages in Shenzhen. And it's estimated they house um, 10 million people, essentially 50% uh, of the city's population. And the urban village, uh, they occupy about 10% of the land, of the residential land. So you essentially have 50% of the population living in 10% of the available residential land. Um, even with this, uh, this incredible uh, density, incredible vibrancy and occupation of these land, they are seen as undervalued and underdeveloped land uh, because they do not fit within the image of what uh, is commonly uh, perceived to be a, a modern city, a beautiful city, and a picturesque city. So that's kind of a, a, a broad overview of the this particular, what, what it is an uh, informal urbanism in Shenzhen, uh, named the urban villages. And next I'd like to show you 
a project we done a couple years ago. It was a it was a competition. Um, it was a competition sponsored by the local uh, municipal government in Shenzhen, and it's quite a special case. It's quite a special location. <coughs> And I, I'd like to share with you uh, for two reasons. One is to further kind of dispel the myth that Shenzhen has no history. Um, and second, uh, as kind of a, uh, a point of, um, you know, a sharing and, and um, sharing and discussion with you about uh, what are the responsibilities, the powers, and limitations of architecture uh, in such a complex urban environment. So... The title, the the project is called Nantou Ancient City Urban Renovation. It's a mouthful, but um, this is a, a, a essentially a, a timeline of Nantou Nantou City. It's actually um, let me see. Remember, recall the the history that I was saying that it, it was found. The Shenzhen was founded in 1979. Um, and that's the day most people assume that's when civilization happened and started to happen uh, on the land. But the, the, the truth is actually there is a, it's kind of faint, isn't it? There is a, uh, a capital city on the region already called Nantou uh, for over 1,000 years. Uh, t actually, technically, 1,700 700 years. It's been this uh, military and administrative center of the entire region since the Jing, Jing Dynasty there. Um, uh, and as it moved into the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty, it slowly actually grew in power and importance over um, the entire the entire region of the Pearl River Delta, including the territories of Hong Kong and Macau. Of course, then um, Hong Kong and Macau was still part of China. And in fact, the military, uh, in fact, the administrative seat of the entire Pearl River Delta at that time was situated in Nantou, located right in the middle of today's Shenzhen. So this particular historic city um, today is this. Uh, a lot of it has been, uh, I would say most of it has been demolished. Um, and a lot of the area, you, you can't really, you cannot see the remnants of the city anymore. But, um, so when, when the competition was called into this site, so this is the perimeter of the historic city. Um, it was clearly stated there are only seven remaining uh, his historic buildings that is registered with the city government as being historic. And the rest of all of these buildings uh, with the high density are considered non-important and uh, non-historical, especially. Um, part of the reason why the government is, is, is very uh, kind of um, anxious to find a solution uh, in how to how to um, restore a certain historical significance to the site and to remind people that they certainly have discovered that Shenzhen actually has a very rich history and, uh, and, and try to, now that the, the, the city has really moved past industrialization and really past urbanization, it's kind of moving into post-industrialization post and trying to kind of brand the city as a green city, as a cultural city, as a, a city with significant uh, culture and heritage. So this is why um, this, this little, this place that has been forgotten essentially during all 30 years of the official urbanization of Shenzhen suddenly is remembered and suddenly saying, okay, let's, let's try to do something. Let's renovate this so that we can show people how, you know, how long of a history Shenzhen has. But the, the difficulty is that there's only seven buildings left that is of any historical value. Um, what are the rest of the buildings? The rest of the buildings, as you can, uh, you can see, it's very, uh, it's very mixed, different heights and different, 
uh, ages, essentially this place has become an urban village. So all of the buildings that were demolished were rebuilt uh, by the local residents uh, into what you've seen in the previous uh, images of these kind of uh, concrete bunkers, con concrete buildings that's been built to house uh, migrant uh, renters who come in and look for housing. Um, and as it is very typical of all of the urban villages, it has a very, very vibrant street life. Um, kind of, these are the, the different uh, commercial and uh, you know, commercial, cultural, and just everyday life that happens in the streets that is, um, to me, quite precious and quite rare in any Chinese city today. Um, this is a analysis. This is an analysis. That this, these three are the main kind of main streets uh, of uh, this particular. It was called, I guess, today's neighborhood of this particular neighborhood, um, with a, a cataloging of all of the programs that's along the street. So uh, the image is too small probably to be read, but every line is a, a different shop with a different uh, program. So you would have like animal hospitals next to a grocery store, next to a cell phone seller, uh, next to a uh, noodle shop, for example. Uh, it, it, so an incredible mix of different program um, and different storefronts. Um, these, it's quite faint, isn't it? Can, sorry. Um, so the orange buildings are the historic buildings that is designated by the city as uh, of value to preserve, but because of many years of neglect, um, they become kind of um, unofficial storage areas for the people who live next door. They kind of sneak in and put their stuff. Um, so all of these photos are kind of taken through cracks of gates and locked doors, so they're, they're, they're not used. And they're kind of just, they've been left there for, for, for 20, 30 years um, because no one knows what to do with them. Um, so the yellow blobs you see, uh, the yellow are the, the type of, uh, when we did a, a detailed survey of the area, the yellow is what we, we have found to be also of, um, of sort of historical significance. They were residential buildings, essentially um, these single story family homes uh, that, that's been left and untouched. So what happens apparently is a lot of the owners either went abroad overseas or they somehow cannot, do not have enough money to invest, uh, to, de to demolish these buildings to build the um, more higher rise buildings as renters. But these, um, but still, there are people living in them as very, very low rent uh, housing. Um, this is a mapping of the available uh, civic in infrastructure. So you see, uh, actually, the the land outside of the outside of the historic city is very well connected, and there's not much there. But inside, the infrastructure only goes as far as the few main streets, and all of these streets. Are kind of have to left, are left on their own to try to, uh, to try to uh, either uh, make their own water supplies and drainage and such. So what happens is that this area um, has a lot of infrastructural problems: a shortage of water, frequent blackouts, uh, frequent flooding uh, during heavy rain. So what we decided that uh, when we took on the competition is that. Um, one of our main goals is to really to be able to upgrade the urban space and the street space uh, for the residents, for the residents to really improve their daily life. Um, so you can see these are everywhere. These are uh, essentially water machines because they don't have enough water in the buildings. So children would line up and put, use these big uh, containers to get water. Um, so the drain is just made very haphazardly on the street. Um, and very unsafe conditions of a wire, uh, self-connected electrical wire. Um, so what uh, we outlined was five major urban design strategies 
um, the, the, the first few are, the first one, it is what is, what was um, specified in the design brief as the main objective is to renovate significant public spaces. So we said, fine, we do that. But we also wanted to upgrade the street space. We wanted to preserve the historical monuments into uh, of something of use. Uh, we also want to conserve the historical residential buildings. Um, and lastly, uh, actually what is most important for us is we wanted to improve the basic public infrastructure with sustainable environmental technologies. So what we develop is a uh, implementable urban uh, street section. Um, the text is quite small, so even I can't see them. Can you see them? Okay, good. Um, so it, it ranges everything from uh, installing water tanks uh, on the roof for uh, rainwater collection and just uh, as a water reserve for use uh, for the building, but also connecting to what, uh, what we're installing kind of periodically, um, these kind of uh, composite or urban infrastructure that will house uh, sanitation, that will house um, uh, sort of new uh, new lighting, street lighting. There's uh, an, uh, essentially after dark, the the whole space is completely in the dark because they don't even have enough electricity to light the the residential bu buildings. Um, and so these uh, water tanks are also designed to be connected to localize fire hydrant, because one of the biggest um, one of the biggest crimes that the government see that the urban village habits that um, is uh, a fire hazard because uh, they, they're saying that the streets are too narrow for normal fire trucks to get into them. So what we had thought is that we really wanted to put these uh, sporadic, uh, sporadically equally spaced throughout the neighborhood so that it can give time for an alternative uh, approach uh, and kind of delay the, the time that's necessary for the uh, fire uh, teams to be able to, to get to the site. Um, we're also proposing to uh, essentially regrade all of the streets um, with uh, new drainage channels that's gonna collect the rainwater for other use uh, as to really prevent current flooding. We're also uh, proposing for uh, new uh, ducts to be planted, uh, water, electricity, uh, telecommunications and such so that it, it can really um, meet the extreme high demand uh, of this area, which um, houses about uh, 100, no, 120, let me say, say 12,000 people actually uh, live in the neighborhood. But the inf infrastructure that's going to here actually is only meant to house a few hundred people. Right? So that's why there, there's the, these huge discrepancy in between. Um, so these were uh, diagrams to show uh, the ways that we really wanted to very simply upgrade uh, the street. Uh, what we didn't want is kind of a total demolition and, and rebuild or to build this into very picturesque spaces because we really wanted to have minimal interference to the daily operations of the shops uh, and the, the urban residents. So this is uh, typical street in the in the in the neighborhood, and we really wanted to preserve as much as we can of what is kind of beautiful that's already there. So it was new street space, uh, lighting, urban furniture, and simple uh, vegetation and and landscape that can um, give life to the city without taking away uh, what's already there. Um, and for the monuments for the historic monuments that has been just uh, completely sectioned off from their everyday life. We wanted to open them up, renovate, it, renovate them, and have all of the historic monuments be uh, visitable spaces that can house what we call a distributed museum. So, every sing so all of the uh, seven historic monuments can become a, a one museum system for people to be able to visit and occupy. And then for the residential buildings, um, to be able to convert some of the residential buildings into uh, museum spaces and community spaces. And what is important is that we really wanted to 
uh, in the renovation still to still keep the street vendors on the street and to actually give them uh, facilities they can use as opposed to uh, typically most of these projects would try to really get rid of them. Uh, and again, uh, sort of lastly, what's really important is we wanted to simply improve the, the basic infrastructure and the environment of the place. Um, so uh, we chose three uh, intersections as the, the three public spaces for more detailed renovation. Um, this is at the entrance of the gate. So the uh, monument, the one of the monumental museum become kind of the entrance museum gallery to house visiting uh, information for the visitors. Uh, whereas the, the rest really goes, the rest of the renovation goes to improving the exi existing residential building. Um, this is uh, at the middle section where we, uh, we wanted to build uh, outdoor theaters and uh, basketball courts and sports facilities and, and just sitting areas for the community uh, right in the middle and, and to provide lighting night lighting for the public spaces and the night markets. Um, again, this is an, another historic monument. It's going to propose it for it to be used and for the urban space to continuously um, be opening into them um, to connect the city, essentially the city's current modern life with the, his with the historical past. Um, the second section, the second component of this um, the second component of this competition was to design uh, a urban cultural park. They want an urban cultural park right outside of the historic city to be able to provide public amenities um, to the, uh, both to the citizen inside and to the, um, to the city in general. And the government gave a, a type of um, an insinuation of what they wanted. Um, they, they really wanted to, to have these pagodas that is scattered throughout the landscape because to them that is what would be historical. But because th this was always a secular place of governance, there was never any pagodas in all of its nearly 2,000 year history. So we said rather than fake history, we really should look into kind of the real cultural heritage of the place. And one thing we have discovered that's really interesting is that um, is that this region, right? Uh, this was all called, before it was Hong Kong, Shenzhen, et cetera, this whole area was called Xi'an. And during the Qing Dynasty, this area is very, very famous, known throughout China, from Beijing to Hunan, et cetera, for its beautiful natural scenery. And that poets, artists, literary people would visit, would travel for months from northern China to this place to visit its local uh, landscapes and sceneries. And it was so well known, it was called uh, Xing'an Bajing, Eight Scenes of Xing'an. And, what, and we, we discovered they actually have real places and real locations. And is the numbers is, is showing they're really scattered throughout the region, even in you know, modern day modern day Hong Kong, modern day Guangzhou, etc. And their drawings and depictions of what these were and associated with each scene was a specific landscape and they had a specific history and a specific title. And what we thought was uh, quite uh, was an opportunity is that in the space to kind of recreate not necessarily uh, sort of fake past or fake imagery, but to create modern landscapes using the vegetation and kind of the poetic essence of these uh, scenes uh, here uh, for modern day use uh, at this location. Um, so the first scene uh, that we have designed actually is a, a pathway, a walkway. Um, because the, the historic first scene was named after this uh, called Wu Tong tree, this really beautiful um, tall uh, species of trees that was very special to the region. So a lot of the scenes were of vegetation and landscape that's only locally available and it's these landscape and these vegetation that's what gave the cultural meaning of the place. 
And what we discovered is that while even though the, the city wall was demolished um, several hundred years ago, but what's interesting is that you, would, you still see a path of it because the, all of the Chinese uh, city walls are built on rammed earth. It's very difficult for vegetation to grow. So even you see that even in locations where dense forest has overtaken the city, um, the, it left kind of this um, trace, if you will, of the, the city wall that was once there. So what we propose is that the first scene is actually a, um, a planted uh, walkway all around the historic city of essentially you will be walking on top of what, one, what once was the city wall. So it, again, this is an example that's through these ways that we wanted to, to uh, really make a composite of something that would be useful to modern day life that still evoke a sense of the history of the place, both spatially and um, culturally. So uh, this is the park. Uh, this is the land that they, they said that they wanted to build into the park with a few very large buildings still remaining. This is a, actually a long distance bus terminal. This is a parking garage. Um, but so the first thing is would be the walk around the historic park and we divided then the rest of the seven scenes in sequence as you would enter from here. Um, this is the first thing. So we tried to, 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 we tried to uh, really use the original names and, and poetry that was associated with the original scene to design the modern landscape. So the original title, for example, for scene one was Parasol Tree Mountain with Heavenly Pond. So, um, so the idea is to really create these very tall vegetation with the local trees that create, create parasols and shade you from the light uh, and the extreme heat of the region. Second scene was called Plum, Peach Plum in Low Mountain. So we used locally uh, well-known peach plum trees to create uh, what are uh, tennis courts and badminton courts um, throughout. So um, I see we're running short on time, so I'm just gonna there, uh, just show you quickly the scenes. So essentially each one is composed of, uh, of the modern day use as a park space and um, utilizing indigenous vegetation that creates a sense of the past and the um, this, this is created as a um, kind of a water landscape so that you w before, when you go from the modern city, before you enter the ancient city, you kind of go through the ceremonial walk. Um, and this water pond is also used as a retention pond for the rainwater that was collect collected throughout the city. So that again, that is programmatically, spatially, and uh, culturally uh, all linked together as layers of space. So uh, the, I said that there was a, a major parking garage structure, uh, for example, and what we did is that we kind of created a, a herb castigate um, that would kind of cover the, the, the parking structure um, because uh, this region, the, the, the final scene of the region was, was really about the local grown herbs that was so fragrant um, that traveled for miles, et cetera. So the sensorial perception along with programmatic, programmatic ideas. So, uh, so in this case, zoning in the park is really by color of the vegetation and by different types of vegetation, uh, going from, sort of from water, uh, wetland spaces to bamboo groves to uh, herb gardens, et cetera. Um, and that's what sort of create the spatial sequence throughout the zone uh, with uh, kind of fully loaded and required a program for the park space. And the different zones that was created in the park are extensions from the streets from inside the historic park. So that again, trying to create uh, a linkage and trying to create a continuum. And th that was the notion I was talking about when uh, sort of the research into the urban villages was is something really inspiring to understand that, that the best way for the city to continue to be, you know, to, to, to not use the word sustainable growth, but really uh, uh, kind of responsible and, and rooted in ideas and culture and the way we live 
is really to, to try to understand history as a continuum, continuum, and that there's equal value to what is happening today <coughs> as the, to the past. Um, in fact, we, when we looked into further history of the place, this uh, area by the Qing Dynasty, its nickname was Nine Streets. So this area, um, what's interesting is that even though there's only a handful of historic buildings left, um, the street pattern, the nine street street pattern, uh, still remained. Uh, it, again, it was from the Qing Dynasty, the street already formed. So the street space, we were so trying to caref carefully preserve that spatial infrastructure was there, and it's what we used to argue to the government that it's really not about the buildings per se, it's really about the urban life and the urban space that continues the urban life. Um, so we were able to convince the international jury panel of the argument of trying to uh, really use a contemporary means to lightly uh, preserve, evoke, and uh, improve the quality of life in this place, uh, along with the UK-based UK uh, architecture office, the two of us were selected by the international jury to be winners of the competition, and we were uh, submitted to the government. The government was supposed to choose one of us to continue with the commission, and the government engaged us to continue further studies, to develop further. Uh, that was two years ago, it's still ongoing. <laughs> um, Part of the issue now is, um, is that uh, s the, the, the some people in the government actually have uh, now wanted, a, a, a have a, a new idea for this place because um, the argument is that if all of the urban villages inside the urban center are being demolished, rebuilt, why shouldn't this one be demolished and rebuilt? Uh, in fact, here's the opportunity to demolish, to demolish the urban village illegal structures and to rebuild what the city once was in its glorious past. Um, obviously, it, it is something that I'm very against. Uh, I, hope it's, it, you know, I hope I don't have to explain uh, why. So currently, we are trying to come up with ways to try to negotiate with the, the local government, the local interested parties, but it is a very difficult struggle because actually the original villagers, meaning the people who own uh, the buildings, uh, they, want, they want this to be demolished. They, they, they want the government to, and developers to invest money so that their buildings will grow in value. So they don't have kind of a, a sentiment with these buildings or the people who, who live in them because essentially they're renters. So, uh, so as I was saying, there's sort of three levels of citizenship and the top two levels of citizenship all want, uh, essentially all want to see these urban villages demolished because they really don't see that it is valuable to a modern city. Um, the, the last citizenship, the, the, the people who live in here because they're, they're migrant workers and they don't have much political sway or economic sway, um, it's, it's very difficult for them to form communities, to form a type of resistance. And us as architects and urban designers and landscape designers, um, you know, it, it is, we have found that now we're, we're shifting from designers into uh, activism and that in fact we must do this in order to, to pursue the type of responsible design that we were trained and educated to do. Um, but this is actually very difficult in the context of a fast developing, urbanizing, economic uh, environment. You know, this sitting here in, in Eugene, Portland, this may seem so obvious. You know, you're sitting there thinking, why? Can, how, how can the government resist this? How can there not be total community outrage? But you, you had to remember, you know, every culture and every space have its moments of urbanization. Just think of the 50s and 60s in New York, in Chicago, you know, think, think of Robert Moses. Um, you know, we, we went through all of that as well. Um, and the historical lessons we have learned are very painful, um, but we haven't exported those lessons. Uh, we've exported star architects, and we exported uh, corporate planning. You know, the, the central planning of CBD was done by SOM. Um, 
so you know we exported all of these things. So I, I would say that in closing, that I hope uh, for the students, all of you, uh, with the sort of great education you're receiving about how to design um, and build responsibly, sustainably, um, I, I hope all of you really uh, gear up towards a very meaningful future in, in which that your role will be significantly um, more important um, in trying to find a place and find a role for that of an architect within a global environment that is very much urbanizing and uh, under a tremendous um, f trend of informalization. Um, so, so for you now to really look upon um, your role, your future, future role, um, you know, I hope that you're both excited and but also feel a sense of duty um, that I, I think a lot of these things, I tell my students in Hong Kong, that I think a, a, a lot of what I'm trying to argue for and trying to change, uh, you know, really namely trying to change the image of the modern city, trying to change the notion that a city should look a certain way, that a green space should look a certain way, a street should look a certain way, and, and you know, a park is necessary even. Um, and I tell my students, probably not going to be me who changed that. You know, I can try to educate and research and probably be, will be my students and maybe eventually your students one day will be able to, to create uh, a new meaning uh, to architecture. Thank you. event uh, right after that. So five minute break. We just right back here for our next panel.